in New York Magazine, and I wish I could have surprised you with this on the podcast, uh, as I do with tweets, but it's a visual of uh, Kamala Harris <laughs> sitting triumphantly on a coconut. Uh, and while well, a bunch of Democrats are like tiny in front of it and they're like partying and it's called Kamalot in a matter of days, Democrats discovered their yes. future was in the White House all along. What's your reaction, Catherine? I hate it so much. I hate it so much. It's it's everything. I, it's the it's the cringe. It's the tribalism. And uh, and it's the. It's the amnesia. It's the hypocrisy. It's all together, right? These are people who have been critical of Harris, rightly, um, who did not see her as an anointed successor, who, you know, stuck with Biden in large part because they didn't think there were good, viable alternatives who are now all just like, ah, I see. New new plan. She's literally Jesus. OK. And here we go. And it's it's, you know, it's embarrassing for everyone, I would say. Um, the the piece of it that that is getting to me is the um, the desire to make her into some kind of um, you know that, that she's sort of they're trying to have her be all things to all people, which is absolutely not going to be possible. Um, there is still just there, the fundamentals of this election are the same, which is it's the border and it's inflation, and she doesn't. She's not well positioned on either of those things. She was the fake, bad, maybe not really, maybe really borders are, according to Axios. And uh, and the inflation thing is associated with Biden and voters don't like it. And Trump's not going to do any better, to be clear, on either of those things. He, in fact, likely will do worse even uh, on the border in particular. But once everybody takes a deep breath and calms down, those two things are still there and they're not going to go away. From a, from a libertarian perspective, this is bad and worse in terms of immigration policy broadly, including on the border. Um, just, you know, one thing that it should we should definitely underscore is that all of this discussion about whether or not she was the border czar, uh, you know, and if Joe Biden gave her vanity license plate that said border czar, the most important thing is that he put her in charge of policies designed to, uh, you know, stabilize the economies and the flow of people out of the main sender countries in Latin America and in Central America. And he actually said, when she speaks, she speaks for me on questions about border security and about uh, policy of those countries. So the fact that the media has gone so far in the other direction to deny any possibility that she was ever in charge of this when all of the same publications now that are talking about this, like have copious articles talking about how she's in charge of the border and boy, things are going to be different now from a few years ago. That is something that is going to, I think, to the extent that people give a shit, it's going to alienate them from the media coverage, which is slobbering and detestable in its Kamala a lot type of thing. Matt, that, that New York Magazine cover is just kind of despicable. Um, in every aspect of it. And when it pairs up with things like the white woman uh, for Kamala Zoom call that Elizabeth Nolan Brown covered, and it's currently going around where literally an influencer kindergarten teacher starts lecturing at people at how to shut the fuck up when people of color are talking and how we, you know, white women have to help get Kamala, uh, you know, elected. These are the types of things that activate and alienate, not not fringe people on the right, you know, not the Tucker Carlson's of the world, uh, but rather people in the middle who are like, you know what, I kind of like this country and I want it to continue going forward. And when you see this kind of extreme overreaction by partisans masquerading as something approaching neutral journalists, that is going to have a negative impact overall, I think, on, the, on, on Kamala and the Democratic Party's uh, process. Peter, uh, picking up on that, uh, when these white women calls started coming uh, forth, I found my body kind of shuddering in that awful thing that happens once in a while uh, when you remember the year 2020, <laughs> like that, like peak insanity when it came to identity politics, just literally insanity. You can't go back and read any story about anything from July 2020 without feeling like you just dropped into the worst possible alternative universe. Um, it, are we just hypersensitive to it uh, and being allergic to it, kind of being on the outside looking in? 
Um, or do you think that might um, suggest a, a bit of a ceiling on how uh, how high the Democratic coalition can go because they're going to alienate the normies with this crap? So when you heard about a bunch of white women organizing to try to elevate a black woman to a, a new level of political power, you felt physically uncomfortable. That's what you're yep. telling me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're canceled. I am reporting that to my witches group immediately. Uh, like Catherine calls out the book. They prefer Wiccan, <laughs> first of all. I would totally vote for a Wiccan or even somebody who worships shrubs. Druids. They've got my vote. I'm going to root for whoever staged the Marie Antoinette speed medal uh, section of the Paris Olympics opening ceremony, which is fantastic. Go on. I, I think the more serious way to answer your question is that so many people who are involved with the Democratic Party and quite committed to it are uh, are, are totally committed, have no other playbook other than the race and gender playbook. That's the only way they can see the world and the only way they can see politics, because this was not white women for Kamala Harris because she's going to X. And then here's a list of policies in a way that she's going to change government. It was not white women for Kamala Harris because she's going to be good at governance. It wasn't even white women for Kamala Harris because Donald Trump is going to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and appoint this guy to be HUD secretary and like have this policy at the department. No, it was just white women for Harris because we're w women. She's a woman. Uh, she's a woman of color. We're white. And this was explicit on the call. Like, oh, and because we're white, we have privilege and need to use right. Like it's just entirely a, a toad, like just a, a shallow race and gender approach to absolutely everything that has no real concern for meaningful governance or substance or anything else. Or the thought that, say, some women, for example, might want to vote for Republicans because of, I don't know, tax policy or anything like that. It's incredibly reductive. Um, it's it's stupid. It's shallow. And the fact that there are prominent Democrats or uh, Democratic partisans still playing this just shows you that they have not been able to move beyond that. And frankly, the Kamala Harris, the, the way that Kamala Harris was coronated shows you that, too. That was a clip from the latest episode of The Reason Roundtable. To watch another clip, click here. To watch the whole episode, click here. And make sure to subscribe to The Reason Roundtable. You'll be glad you did.